Okay, so, right. My name is Nicholas Jacob, and I'll be presenting on reinforcement learning for derivative pricing. I know the um, it is the I would have said option pricing, but I'd say it's a little bit more general and go with derivative pricing. See, and for and yeah, options are like essentially a type of derivative. So, I start with a uh, uh, broad this outline first. Uh, just give a bit of a formal definition of a derivative. So, hope just a brief overview of reinforcement learning. I'll talk about why applying reinforcement learning to this problem, but not oh yeah, why apply it to this problem, why it's suitable for this problem, and then I'll discuss the paper. All right, so I guess first we'll talk about derivatives. So I guess you'll start with suppose we have some risky asset U with a stochastic price process given by I guess U of T for T greater than zero. Um, so from this, we can derive or construct another risky asset D with spot price T and, and we'll have um, where D of T, D at time T would be a deterministic function of U of T at exactly one point in the future. And so that it will be that as, at some point in the future called T, um, or capital T, the price of D and U will be related according to the equation shown here. So it's D of T is equal to just some function G of U of T. And here, I guess the U is called the underlying asset, D is the derivative, and T is the maturity date. And the function is generally called the payoff function of the derivative. Uh, I guess how are derivatives priced? So based on the definition above, pricing, uh, the derivative is essentially finding a functional mapping from U of T to D of T for all T less than the maturity date. And we have a couple of assumptions. First of all, we will assume arbitrage is not possible. So this just means that, um, well, no arbitrage would mean that you cannot construct scenarios in which you could make a profit without any risk of, of loss. So people, you, you um, generally how this would come about is if there's some sort of um, mispriced asset or derivative. And yeah, people take advantage of the mispricings to essentially get away profit without any possibility of losing. So we'd assume that no such mispricings exist. And U of T would be a Markov process. And I guess this is a kind of, kind of, at a kind of high level, uh, the Markov process would be a sort of um, a class of random processes where the future sort of depends on the past, unlike some other processes, um, random processes like um, memoryless, which would be considered memoryless, like even Bernoulli or, or Poisson processes. And well, to some extent, you can even predict the future based on the past. And it involves the notion of a state, essentially, that evolved over time with some probability, dis probability distribution. And in a sense, the state sort of links the past to the future. And the new state at the, uh, I guess, uh, at the new state at any given time would be a function of the old state plus some noise. And I guess a, a more formal definition would really be that the um, for Marco process, the future is independent of the past given the present. So, it's the, I guess the present sort of encapsulates all the, everything you'd need to know about the past. You could sort of like ignore everything but the past going forward. And then the, yeah, we have the idea of like the fair price of a derivative and is the discounted expected value of the derivative, which is just the function of the underlying asset given the underlying asset. I'll give the, the price of the underlying asset at, at some time. And so now problems you, you'd encounter with pricing derivatives. And well, so first of all, the fair price formula that we, we showed above is not always analytically tractable, which means that you, it can't really, can't really be solved with any analytical method. We'd have to do it. You'd have to basically be, it, it would have to be approximated or solved numerically. And also another thing is finding the expected values of D would require some kind of deep knowledge about the underlying like price process, price process UT and I guess this sort of any, any kind of detailed knowledge about this price process may not having such detailed knowledge of it may simply not be possible in, in real world scenarios. And often some of the required assumptions that you use in some of the models for pricing derivatives tend to break down in real life. So I think the last time I spoke on options, I uh, mentioned the um, Black Schultz models for pricing options. And I guess some of the assumptions there was that um the returns of the stock price was, um, the, the returns followed a log normal distribution, but in real life we tend to see some, in, in, real, in real world data we tend to see some jump discontinuities and sort of fat tails that 
and and so and will the log normal distribution would, would neither be discontinuous nor factual. So it, it kind of break down in that case. And now a sort of extremely brief overview, extremely brief and high level overview of reinforcement learning. So reinforcement learning would be a machine learning approach considered consider the creation of computer programs that can solve problems that require intelligence in a sense. So by intelligence, in this case, I would loosely defined as the ability to acquire and apply knowledge and skills. And even if you, it no, doesn't necessarily require intelligence, it's sort of perceived that way at least, so it's perceived to require intelligence. And so it's a, it's a task of learning by trial and error, essentially from feedback, but the feedback is usually sequential, evaluative and, and um, sampled, and I'll get back to that a bit later. And uh, yeah, I'll, I guess, discuss some of the, I guess, key terms that you kind of look out for when you're talking about uh, reinforcement learning. So the, the agent would sort of be like the formal name of the computer program that I mentioned earlier. So it's, the, it's, um, it's like the decision maker, the thing making the decisions and that's trying to learn from trial and error essentially. And the environment would be everything external to, to like this, the code or the agent or the decision maker or everything that it doesn't have like total control over. So for example, if we have some scenario of trying to change some type of um, robot arm to pick up objects, even like even the hardware itself, or like the robot arm is considered part of the environment, since in a sense it's still subject to forces outside the purview of the code or, the, or strictly the agent. And then you have the idea of like state, which is like a parameterization or sort of representation of the environment. And the state space would be the set of all possible states or configurations that the environment can take. And no, I guess I'll have like so. There's the state, and then there's their observations. So, I guess sometimes due to noise and whatnot, the, the actual state isn't completely accessible to the agent. So, the obs an observation is just like a representation of the state as perceived by the agent. And next, we have like the transition function, which would be a function that would map. I guess we call a transition tuple, which would be like the current state. The action that um, the action taken at this state and the new state that you'll end up at, and it will map those to probabilities. Uh, the reward function would map the the same transition tuples to scale in a sense. So it's like a sense like a reward for the given action or how uh, sort of evaluation of how good the action was. While it can be negative, I guess if it's like a poor action, it's still referred to as reward. And the model of the environment refers to the set of all transition and reward functions. And we mm -hmm. have notion of a policy, which is sort of like, it, uh, it prescribes what action to take for some given, I guess, non-terminal states. So terminal states would be states that you can't leave once you enter them. So it's like, once you enter it, you kind of stuck there and you can't do anything else. But yeah, it, it prescribes what actions to take from, uh, yeah, from non-terminal states as essentially a distribution over actions given states. So it's like the probability of some action A given some state S. And time the, the time horizon sort of um, is can be thought of like as the agent's perception of time. So if you have like a finite time horizon, in a sense, the agent sort of knows that the task will terminate in some finite number of steps. And you can have like an infinite time horizon or whatnot, but it, it, it's not really sure. I mean, it could end due to some sort of external factor, but yeah, the agent itself is not really aware of that. And, uh, and another thing is like, um, we have like a, a discount factor to account for, I guess, the passage of time. So at each step, essentially, you'll perform some action and you'll, you'll get a reward, but sometimes uh, due to, I guess, uncertainty, we'd want to put less, more or less value on a reward, depending on when you receive the reward. So sometimes you, want, you might want to wait rewards further in the future less. That's where the discount factor would sort of come in. You would like, uh, discount the ones further down to make it, I guess, less. So it wouldn't have as much of an, an impact. And yeah, that is what there. Yeah. I guess so we, we've talked about the, the reinforcement learning cycle, essentially. So first you have the agent observing the environment. And it'll, it'll observe the environment, it'll receive some sort of reward, it'll improve, and yeah, it'll use the reward to attempt to improve at the task, and then it would send an action to the environment and attempt to control, uh, in, in attempt to, I guess, 
arrive at some, I guess, more favorable outcome. And then the environment would sort of tran trans um, would transition to some new state as a result of, I guess, the current state and the action that was taken. And then, I guess, this cycle would just sort of continue. And yeah, so some of the, I guess, challenges to overcome is I guess, some of the challenges that, I guess, that we presented because of the nature of the problem would really be that, um, so first of all, the, the feedback that the agent would receive would be sequential, meaning that um, there's this sort of like temporal credit assignment problem. So there's, it's kind of like um, trying to determine which state and or action is responsible for a given reward, because since this all can happen in sequence, you could take an action now and get a reward. The actual reward for it might happen like two or three or five, like, I guess, steps down the line. So in the history of the action that you take now is immediately responsible for the reward that you receive. So, so that's only problems. And the feedback is also evaluative. So this leads to sort of exploration, exploitation trade-off. So the reward is sort of like an indicator of goodness, really, and not correctness. And what this means is that, so it doesn't contain information about, I guess, potential other rewards, or how the current reward that you receive compares to, I guess, others. So you must either exploit, I guess, rewards that we already know versus explore to figure out if we could, um, if there are, I guess, possibly any better rewards. So I guess there's also a trade-off between this. And finally, the, the feedback is sort of sampled and this would, lead a, this would um, require us needing to sort of generalize in the face of incomplete information. So the agent does really have access to the, the reward function and Sometimes, and I guess the speed uh, or action space might be extremely large or even infinite. And, and the best way, the best you can really hope to do is sort of generalize from the sample of the total feedback that we happen to observe. And uh, I guess I'll mention, I guess, a uh, mark of decision processes. So I guess the, this is, so it can be thought of like the, as the general framework for modeling, which the any complex sequence, sequential decision-making problems under uncertainty. And this would be the notation for it that you'd see in some places. And, You'd have the state space, the action space, the, trans, uh, the transition function, uh, the reward signal R or the reward function. Um, and you also have like a um, set of initial states, should be like this S data. You'd have the discount factor and I guess the horizon, which is the sort of, which I sort of mentioned before as the agent sort of perception, perception of time and what's with you with that. And Yes, yeah, so I guess some of the equations for dealing with um, markup decision processes. So, so we'll have first of all like the state value function, which should essentially be this um, is the sort of expect, expected value over what will be known as pol well, policies, which I which I would have defined before. The expected value over these policies of um, GFT. In, in this case, GFT, GFT is the return, which is um. This is a sort of like a possibly weighted sum of the returns from time t going forward or from time t until some good time in the future, given the current state. And you tend to use what's known as like the Bellman equation for finding the value of these states, which is this here, which is um, what you'd have is you sort of have you sort of weigh by the, I guess, the policy for this given, for, um, of, I guess, of a given action for, of an action given the state, and you, you sort of sum over those, and you also weigh by, I guess, the probability of the next state and the reward that you receive given the current state and the action. And you sort of take these as weights for, I guess, the current reward, and then discount the sort of landing landing state, the value of the landing state. So this would be the V pi, or v pi of S prime here, which is like the discounted value of the landing state. Another thing would be the action value function, which is this expected value over the policy of the, once again, you have the return. But yeah, this is given the state S and the action E. And this, we also have the Berman equation this way as well and i guess we also have this idea of so so we sort of have like the policies the state value function the active value function and i guess there's also another thing called the action advantage function which is like the difference between the state
sikit value function and the action value function but then the um, uh, put an equation for it here but it exists on um, yeah. so basically these are all sort of components that we use to describe evaluate and um, also improve behaviors but also there's this idea of like optimality so we want these components to be as best as they can be and so we have we have equations we essentially yeah, so we have notation for notation for defining sort of the best possible, I guess the best configurations of, of these functions. So for example, for something like the um, the value function, the the optimal state value function would be something like the best value function. I guess you know, it would be like the value function is the highest value at, at, across all policies, and the optimal action value function would be sort of like the I guess it would be like a similarly, similarly defined thing to be the best one out of the possible ones for the given policy. And yeah, also for the, the, I guess there are also Bellman automatic equations describing these things and how to arrive at them. I uh, didn't um, mention them here. But, yeah. I guess another thing is why is, I guess, reinforcement learning applicable to this problem? Well, that would be because trading can be viewed as a um, Mark of decision property and mark of, mark of decision process and well, mark of decision process, as I mentioned, was sort of like the environment, like a description of the environment that you know, um, reinforcement learning would take place in. And another thing is that finding the optimal value function, essentially, or the optimal value is sort of the, the same thing as finding the fair price that we uh, sort of mentioned before. And I guess this is sort of how you'd frame trading as a mark of decision process. And here you have at each step recently, you have like one of two actions that you can take. You can either choose to sell or hold the derivative, which would be this first condition we need here. And so there's also this kind of assumption that um, the overall market state is independent of the action taken at time t. So sort of um, whether or not you sell or hold your individual derivative, it doesn't really have any kind of significant effect on the overall market. That's why there's no assumption. And yeah, so also we have yeah, this idea of the state essentially is like the market conditions and your position, the MT referring to market conditions and the MQ referring to your your position. Um, it wasn't entirely clear, essentially, I didn't really go into much depth on like trying to clarify exactly what I meant by your position, but I think it seemed to have to do to I guess whether or not you held the um the stock or not or whether you held held it to maturity. And exercise it or whether you, you didn't. The derivative, whether or not you held the derivative to, to um, expiry or yeah, to, until T, the capital T, until that time, maturity date or not. And so also we have, yeah, so we have the um, state action reward function essentially. Um, and this model will simply be this would, this would be equal to the um, trader's monetary compensation, which would be this R of R S of T, A of T. And it will be just DT if. We happen to sell sometime before the maturity, and then it'll just be, um, I guess, its final value is equal to the payoff of the derivative. If you happen to, well, I guess, if you get to maturity, because if you get to maturity, then you you'd have to exercise the the um the option. In, in this case, also we um go on to also look at the we have what we have here is like the this um the value function would be. It's just sort of the sum of the expected future reward of a given strategy or policy, and this will be discounted to time t. So that's why it's sort of um, this factor for discounting in front. And all this will be given the current state. And I guess from there, we can go on to, I guess, define how we would have like the, the q function. I guess, yeah, another, another name for the um, action state function is q function. And you'd go on to show how we define that. And I guess. We, we sort of extend this further. I mean, I, I, wish, I don't show the actual derivation here, but we could extend this further until we arrive at this result here where the optimal, this V star S, S of T here, the optimal value equal to the fair price. So that's how we sort of frame this trading scenario in terms of a macro decision process. See, so yeah, now we'll sort of get into the results from the piece that I was looking at. So, Yes, in terms of data, because um, uh, whenever I look around, you don't tend to see a lot of, I guess, this open data sets for you to play around with, like, data sets of, I guess, actual, like, viewable data for you to just play around with. I think in some cases, I saw this, you have to, like, pay for it or, or 
yeah, you don't really see much open in this figure pyramid. Yeah, in this example, they, they sort of simulated it. They just sort of created like a thousand random deconstructed European calls with varying underlying assets. K, which would represent the strike price. T, which would represent the maturity date. And they sort of uh, had 11,000 randomly generated transitions. But at each step, I guess they would sort of decide whether to hold or sell, and they sort of just randomly generated 11,000 of those. And the details of the underlying asset were sampled from a log normal distribution, which is, I guess, one of the same distributions that they've used in the Black Scholes model. And the spot price of the derivatives, which is the price they would sell at that some given point, was assumed to be the, the same as the price they obtained from the Black Scholes model. And I, I sort of, I'm sort of referring to the Black Scholes model because I sort of um, derived it in the, the, the last time I gave one of these talks. Uh, so I guess, yeah, <laughs> I guess it might seem like a big gap missing here, but I'm just sort of kind of referring back to, to that. And I get the implementation here. They, they used something known as um, kernel based reinforcement learning. So, what, what they did was like they had the, they constructed this sort of approximate finite mark of decision process in, instead of like the actual one. And what they found that was, well, it, it, I guess it was shown in, I guess, previous week that the exact solution of, I guess, this M in this case would be the mark of decision process and the value function. The optimal value function can do just the exact solution of this, I guess, M prime and V prime star, which would be the mark of decision process, the constructed one, the, the finite constructed one, and its value function. And yeah, so the transform reward function of the constructed um, mark of decision process are defined in terms of a kernel function with, a, I guess, some bandwidth B and a distant metric D. So that's where it gets in, like the, the kernel based method. Kernel based, yeah. So that's where the um, kernel based in the name comes from, essentially. And yeah, so sort of the results that they have gotten. So for, for this, they would have used initially a Gaussian kernel and Euclidean distance. And what they found was that for small bandwidths, the, they sort of get like a, a bumpy value function approximation. And I guess increasing B sort of just smoothened it out as, yeah, I guess it smoothened out with um, increasing values of B. And then for large B, the optimal value consistently overestimated the fair value price of out of the money options as out of the money meaning meant that um, so sort of if you were to exercise the option at that point in time you would um you'd not make a profit essentially and uh, yeah or the payoff would be would be zero and uh, another thing is that it was found that the sort of inherent symmetry of the euclidean distance metric was sort of undesirable for pricing options. So they used, uh, I guess, uh, some different distance metric that they didn't really name. We just said it had an exit contour and that improved the results. And then the values obtained from this model was sort of compared to the black Scholes values. And I guess uh, one thing was that they didn't really give any sort of tabular results for this. All they sort of gave were, were like these two graphs essentially to show the results and what they had here, I guess we could it still you could still I guess learn something from observing the graphs because um so they have their approximated um, value function here, which is so so this is which represents the fair price of the of the call right with a strike price key. And I guess what you see here is I guess what we can expect is like if it just look along the axis um, which represents the UT, which is just the um value of the underlying asset, you see that the the um the value function sort of decreases with decreasing um what do you call it? Yeah, with decreasing value of the underlying asset, which which makes sense if the, if the underlying asset is less valuable, you sort of the possible payoff, which would sort of determine the value of the derivative decreases. But uh, something that I guess another thing that you could, that could probably note was that it didn't really seem to time didn't really seem to affect the value that much, which is, um, I guess sort of weird because um, I guess there's sort of a whole sort of like branch, like when you're studying options, essentially there's this idea of like theta, which which is which um represent how uh options value um varies with time. So it's essentially like a derivative of the price. So it's like the is the derivative of the Black Scholes formula for for the option with respect to the time, and you call it theta. And so it usually have variation um according to theta. So but here you don't really see and much of it at all. And then they show Sort of the approximate the, the approximation error. So CT here would represent the Black Scholes estimation of the of the um of the fair value of the option. 
and I guess in some places it just sort of varies wildly. But you see for like, I guess, um, low value underlying assets and times close to expiration, which would be like uh, down here where I guess the T minus C axis is near zero. You tend to see it's, I guess, the approximation error attempts tends to be almost here. So it tends to be like really close for, for those particular values. I guess it'll be interesting to know why they didn't really, I guess they didn't really give any sort of analysis, uh, try to I guess, ex explain why that was the case. But I guess, yeah, that was just something I guess to note. And with that, uh, this is the end. So yeah, this, uh, this is really sources that I would have used. And yeah, so now I guess I'll ask you if there are any questions. Yeah, and, and uh, nice talk, uh, Nicholas. Um, <clears throat> so, uh, are there any examples of uh, people actually using this for for for, for trading? Or I don't, I don't think I saw any examples of people actually using it for trading. I mean, I I, I could look some more and see if I find any, but I, I didn't see anyone else. Okay. Because I, I guess yeah, here you will have to derive the policy and then you know deploy that policy in real time, right? So um, and and then update the policy in parallel. Um, but the ch rate of change of the policy, yeah, I, I mean it, it, it is it is an interesting problem. <laughs> uh, thanks. Um, yeah, I'm sort of new to this. I'm kind of now, and I started to look into it. So yeah, I don't. I'm not that knowledgeable about it, but I'll definitely continue to look. Into it. Yeah, no, it's an interesting area. I mean, not only for, for for trading, but for for other things. I mean, it's it's um, yeah, interesting. Thanks.